all of these things are just in battle constantly with our biology. Although I'm saving lives and improving people's lives, I'm potentially decreasing my life years and decreasing my quality of life because of that. Surgical doctor, TikToker, YouTuber. NHS surgeon in the UK. And uh, you're also a content creator with 5 million people following you on TikTok. Being a doctor is up there with one of the most stressful jobs you can have. For me, an important outlet in my life is social media. I was just getting loads of messages from my friends saying, hey, you're on this website, you're on this news journal, you're on this blog, you're on newspaper. And I was like, well, I went to the Prime Minister of the UK to number 10 Downing Street and took over his Snapchat channel to debunk misinformation about COVID. What do you think are everyday things that people could change to improve their lives? I would ignore the bunch of what you see in all of these wellness bro podcasts. There are very few foundational things that everyone can do. You're an NHS surgeon in the UK. Uh, you're a lecturer at the University of Sunderland. Um, you're an educator. Um, and uh, you're also a content creator with, uh, I think I see, saw you, you have almost a half a million on Instagram, 5 million people following you on, on TikTok um, and a weekly newsletter about life hacks and, uh, and health questions and so on. Um, and uh, you joined, I read you joined TikTok in 2019, um, but you posted on YouTube before that. Um, was that kind of like longer form education or how did, how did it even get started on the YouTube side of things? Yeah, I mean, uh, I started on YouTube uh, back in 2012, kind of the bad old days of YouTube when, you know, things were a bit more like the Wild West. And I was still in medical school at the time. And I realized there was a sort of a gap in the market for educational videos for medical students or even junior doctors uh, wanting to brush up their clinical skills. And so the videos I posted and made in 2012 were very targeted and directed towards healthcare professionals and healthcare students, nurses, medical students, etc. And that gained a bit of a cult following and people enjoyed those type of videos. But I just couldn't keep up with, you know, editing all those videos and uploading it because, you know, it takes a lot of work on YouTube for making those long videos. Mm. And I was busy with medical school finals and then being a doctor. So I didn't post on YouTube after 2013 up until essentially... 2019, 2020, uh, cause it was so much work and I couldn't do it. But then, you know, TikTok came along and it's easier to make content on there. And so now I've used my platform on TikTok and Instagram to go back on YouTube and start making more content, uh, now that I've got an audience on other platforms. Uh, so yeah, I kind of did it the other way around and take a, took an unintended break from YouTube as well. What was the first impulse you had in 2012 to uh, to create this content? Because I guess it's it's not the most common thing to do whilst you're in, in medical school. Yeah, so I, I always enjoyed being in front of the camera, making videos, acting, editing. So I enjoyed that production side of things and, you know, the drama essentially, like drama studies and things like that. When I was in school, that's something I enjoyed and I used to be involved in plays. So I always felt naturally comfortable in front of the camera and doing things and speaking and things like that. So for me... I wanted to combine that with education, which was another uh, facet of my, you know, thing which I, I like to do. I like to teach other medical students. I like to give lectures even at medical school and tutorials, all these kind of things. So for me, making those videos seemed like a bridge between the acting and being in front of camera and the educational side of things. And at that time, the quality of medical education on YouTube was terrible. It was either really poor quality footage or just wrong information, not misinformation yeah. that we know of now where people promote pseudoscience, but just it was inaccurate. So I thought, let me get into this and do my own thing. And if you fast forward until 2019 and, and almost then lockdown in 2020, um, what was it then that, that made you do it? The medical field is a, it's a pretty conservative field. Uh, so like, I, I guess not a lot of people do this. There's a couple of things. So one of the reasons that I got on was around the time uh, when COVID became a bigger thing in Europe and specifically the UK, I saw a lot of people 
walking around supermarkets with latex gloves. You know, they wanted to avoid the germs. And, you know, that seems you know, common sense, right? You've got to wear gloves and you avoid picking up germs. But actually, if you look at the science behind that, you're just accumulating germs and moving them from one place to another. If you're wearing these, um, you know, latex rubber gloves everywhere, it's ridiculous. And I was so frustrated at seeing these people in supermarkets wearing these gloves and touching everything. And I thought, that's ridiculous. They're not washing their hands. So at the end of my night shift, just before I was leaving, I literally made a video uh, talking about how if you wear gloves, you keep picking up germs. And I wore a glove on my hand and drew the germs on my hand and how it accumulates. And that was one of my first videos to go viral. And the next day, I was contacted by all these news outlets saying, can we use this video? And one of my colleagues said his family member in Malaysia had seen my video within 24 hours. So I thought, wow, that's that's pretty um, impactful. So I thought it's a good platform to just reach a wide audience and then talk about um, health information or even debunk misinformation. So the people with the latex gloves in the stores, was this uh, at lockdown when this happened or was this? I think okay. it was just before lockdown when there was information put out that obviously there's this virus and you need to keep washing your hands and avoid touching surfaces and then, you know, doing things like that. And the virus can accumulate mm. on surfaces. It's aerosolized, etc. And the guidance then was to regular hand washing using uh, alcohol-based sanitizers, etc. But a lot of people thought that you could avoid all of this by just wearing gloves. And if you have a glove, it's going to protect you from touching the germs. Um, but clearly that is not in keeping with science. So I was just so frustrated at this and, you know, unnecessary use of gloves uh, by people. And I just thought, let me just make this very simple. And I used like a visual representation and, you know, it got millions of views and uh, kind of catapulted my interest into using TikTok and short form platforms a lot more to circulate health information. And that first video, uh, was that on TikTok? Yeah, that was probably not my first video, maybe kind of 20 or 30 in when I was stuck in the growing stages. Um, I was on TikTok and yeah, then I, in the next 24 hours, I finished the night shift and I was asleep the next morning and I woke up around 3 or 4 p.m. after the night shift and I was just getting loads of messages from my friends saying, hey, you're on this website, you're on this news uh, journal, you're on this blog, you're on you know this newspaper. And I was like, whoa. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I want I want to understand uh, more about you know the the setup you have in your life because you're you're working full time as a surgeon uh, in London right and um, that's a that's a pretty demanding uh, and tough job. How do you balance your life and uh, uh, how does that work for you? Yeah, I would be lying if I said I always manage to balance everything in my life. It's not possible because I think when you sign up to be a doctor and particularly when you're a surgeon, you don't have a fixed nine to five job. Mm. You know, you come in at 8 a.m. to start the shift. And if a surgery runs over because it's a challenging case, then it runs over. You can't mm. just see like, see you later guys at five o'clock in the middle of surgery. That's, you know, not mm. possible. Or at 5 p.m. if there's a patient who suddenly becomes very unwell, you have to sort that out. You can't just clock out uh, and, you know, leave the patient to their own devices. So there's an understanding that sometimes you need to go above and beyond normal working hours, um, which can accumulate over time. So, you know, if that extra emergency happens three days a week and that's an extra three hours to your week that you're not paid just out of hours, then it can slowly accumulate and you get these stresses and then you're late for dinner with your family. You know, you're late for an event, you're you know late for an appointment because of this. And you're just tired and burnt out. So then it leaves as little time for other things in your life. Maybe going to the gym is compromised. Having dinner that evening at a decent time is compromised. Spending time with your family, with your dog, etc. All these things can be affected. For me, an important outlet in my life is social media. I really enjoy social media. It's a different thing that's not surgery, that's not the stresses of medicine. Um, so it's a coping strategy sometimes to make videos and editing and all that. I enjoy that. It's cathartic. But at the same time, some of that is compromised by having these excessive hours. And for me, one of the ways I try to balance that is I will earmark certain times where I'm not going to do anything but this. You know, mm. I am going to the gym for this hour, this time. That's non-negotiable. I am going to sleep at 11 p.m. 
or 10 30 whatever so i'll put some strict boundaries in my life so you know i'm not bringing work into life and life into work do you see weekends as kind of like a holy day or do you mix it all up and, and a, a wednesday is the same thing as a sunday or how, how do you see that yeah unfortunately for me all the days sometimes bleed into one because unfortunately patients still get sick on the weekends i have weekend on calls mm. Um, the next weekend I'm on call from Friday through to Sunday. Um, so for me, Sunday could be a mon Monday, could be a Wednesday, could be a Thursday. Nights could be day, days could be nights. So for me, I'll take each day as it comes. In a 24-hour block, I will see what my commitments are, okay? So I've got a clinic at this time, I've got surgery here, and I've got this many hours free at home, and I'll just divide it up that way. Sometimes it doesn't make for good reading, and I'll look through the week and I'll think, Oh my God. So I really don't have much free time to myself because I've got all these other things to do. But increasingly, I'm beginning to understand through trial and error how to balance my life. And I'm still working towards it. I, you know, I'd be lying if I said I had the perfect work life balance. I don't. I probably have a really bad work life balance, but I am slowly improving it. And in the content creation, do you also like set aside a certain, you know, amount of time that I'm going to. I'm going to do this. Is it like daily or do you find like a few times in the week that, that you do it? Like, I guess you can also like pre preempt and, uh, and plan for it uh, ahead. But how, how do you manage that? Cause I know myself, it can be quite time consuming um, at times. Yeah, massively. I think one of the things when I started making content, I underestimated the amount of work it takes when I didn't make any content, I would always look upon content creators and think, ah, oh, I'd love to have that job. They've got such an easy life and just making videos <laughs> all day. But now that I'm actually doing it, I fully r respect and appreciate how much of a work and burden it is. It's 24 seven for some people. Uh, it can yeah. be a 24 seven thing. You're breathing, thinking, eating content all the time. It's stressful. When I started on TikTok and on social media in general, my content was very basic. It was amateurish where I would just literally talk to the camera. So that didn't require much planning or effort or anything really on my part. So I could make a video in a minute. It would be a reaction video or just talking about some health fact. And for me, it didn't eat into my time a lot. But then as my audience grew, the expectation grows. And then you evolve as well as a creator. You know that you improve your production quality, you improve your editing, lighting, all this kind of stuff. So uh, me now, where I was two and a half, three years ago, I'm in a different space where my content does take longer. So on days off, I will say, okay, between 9 a.m. and 11 a.m., I'm going to make videos, whether it's one or three or five or none, or I'm just scripting stuff. That is the two hours you've got. And after that, hmm. you're going to do other stuff. You're going to get up hmm. out of your library and do other stuff because you can't make content for 12 hours. And that's a, you know imposition I put on myself. So speaking about the content, I think it's uh, I think it's a super interesting mix that you have because it, it's everything from um, you know hilarious stuff and commenting on on TikTok trends to um, you know more more serious things um, like slowing. I saw one video about slowing uh, brain decay, um, and uh, I saw another one of uh, you know. Uh, suggestions on sexual positions after hip surgery recovery yeah. <laughs> uh, glycemic index in, in ripe uh, versus uh, green bananas and so on how do you generate that creativity i think we underestimate the amounts of information that we are presented with on a daily basis and for me i you know i, I draw on inspiration from work things i see on tv things that followers of mine message me and all of that if I suddenly have an interesting idea, I would note it down straight away. Like I, I've got pages and pages of pages um, on my Word documents, on my notes app, screenshots on my phone, photos of that, of stuff that I might find interesting that I might want to make a video about. For example, the banana thing, I was literally eating a banana that day and my dad said to me, oh, why don't you get one of the normal bananas? And I said, no, I like this green banana, this slightly greenish banana, and I enjoy it. And I said something to him. I said, it's got slightly more fiber in it. And he's like, no, it doesn't. It's the same. And, you know, I thought, okay, you know, I, I rate my dad as a pretty knowledgeable guy, you know, when it comes to just health stuff. I mean, he's quite health conscious. So I thought, okay, so clearly there's some lack of understanding here about the difference between a ripe and unripe banana. So maybe that's a good, interesting topic. 
So I just draw on random sources of information and things I see in my life, and I just note down everything. Um, so I don't forget or lose that potential idea for the future. And realistically, I will not make a video about 99% of the stuff that I've noted down. Uh, but I've just noted it down because you never know when you might do something about it. So you have kind of like an idea repository there where yeah. if, you, if you feel one day that you, you don't have the creativity, you can go back to it. Do you also divide those ideas into like more serious ones and more entertaining ones and, and the educating ones? Or do you just let that flow freely as well? Uh, yeah, I mean, I don't divide them anymore. I kind of used to divide them into, you know, body parts or certain kind of things. But now the more division more comes just to change the flow of the topic. For example... Um, I remember last year I had made almost three or four videos in a row about like farting and pooping and bowels. And I thought, okay, I'm going to very fast. People are going to like know me as like the butt doctor or something. I, I need to just break it up a little bit, you know? So I would conscientiously sometimes change the flow of the theme. Sometimes if I'm making too many videos on sleep or neuroscience or, you know, gut health or whatever, I just want to mix it up a little bit because I don't like to be pigeonholed or niche down to a certain thing. A lot of content creators talk about, you know, you need to niche down. I just don't enjoy niching down. I like to talk about everything because maybe, uh, I, you know, I don't know. My mind likes to wander and just talk about as much as I can. So that's the only um, kind of limitation I'll post. I won't post like 10 videos in a row about ears or belly buttons. So I'll try to mix it up. I second that. I think, um, you know, I'm also very much into being a generalist and kind of like looking at, you know, within a certain field. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm interviewing everybody from like entrepreneurs to DJs to doctors to content creators to musicians and so on. And I think for me, I'm just interested about life and, and their yeah. lives and, and talking about that. Um, but I think it's I think that's it's so interesting because I've been talking to people who've um, you know, become really big content creators in different fields. So, um, you know, there's there's a field called FinTalk, which is basically the the finest people at TikTok. Uh, there's Blind Talk, which is blind right. people educating people about blindness on TikTok. Uh, so I guess there's a Med Talk or a I don't know what it's called Doc Talk or, Doc or something like that. Yeah, yeah, Health Talk. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I I I see that there there are some. Uh, there are some doctors in, especially in the US and I guess, especially in the US. Uh, but is that like people that you also kind of know? Is it, is it like that you're in contact with these people or, or is everybody doing it uh, in a silo by themselves? Yeah, I, I think initially there's always this silo approach, but then as you grow a certain following on any platform, you tend to gravitate towards other creators who are creating similar content, who might have similar mm -hmm. audience sizes. And you connect and I think it's just natural, you know, birds of a feather flock together type of philosophy. And I've connected with various content creators over the years, lots of healthcare creators, nurses, doctors, surgeons, etc. on TikTok and Instagram and YouTube, but also other content creators as well. Um, certain content creators who talk about chronic illness, um, who talk about video stuff, editing stuff, who talk about finance or journalism. And you just, you know, it's people that you find interesting and sometimes you're surprised to find out that they follow you back and then you sort of, you engage with them. And for me, I relish meeting and engaging and learning from all of these other non-medical creators because my day job, obviously, I'm surrounded by doctors and nurses and other healthcare professionals. And if you ever hang out with doctors outside of work, they always talk about medical stuff. And I find that incredibly boring. So it's refreshing for me to connect with non-medical professionals and definitely content creators. It's a new world for me. I mean, I've been on TikTok and I've seen a resurgence on social media over the last two and a half, three years. So for me, it's all new and learning about it still, even though I've grown a certain size. I, I just love talking content stuff with other creators. And for me, it's a refreshing change of pace from just medicine all day. Yeah, it's uh, it's in a very different world. Like, I I used to be in finance. Like, this was many years ago, and uh, you know, it, it's it's similar in some ways. I think because of the expectation on 
um, on certain things you should be and should do, I guess. I've never, you know, been in the medical field, but I've, I have some friends who are, and then you have like lawyers, etc. You know, it's a, it's a very different world. So it kind of gives you that relief from just doing something really different. Um, and, um, I, I think it's, I think it's really interesting because as you say, the more you grow, it kind of open up conversations with other types of creators and also people, um, that might follow you back. Um, do you have any like examples of what kind of opportunities this has opened up for you, um, that you might've not expected, you know, three years ago when you got started, like, uh, for real, uh, into this? Um, yeah, I think it's opened a lot of doors. Um, you know, for a lot of creators, there is potential to make a lot of money uh, doing brand deals, etc. I don't really do any brand deals, but if I wanted to for certain things, that opportunity, you know, can be there, can present itself. But more so than that, uh, it's more collaborations with institutions that I'm a part of. For example, uh, last year, the Royal College of Surgeons, which I'm a member of in the Royal College of Surgeons England, they approached me to make some content for them. Uh, the British Red Cross... Um, the WHO, uh, the World Health Organization, um, the UN. I was part of um, a collaborative called Team Halo, which was combating um, health information and COVID misinformation. Uh, I went to the Prime Minister of the UK, the ex-Prime Minister of the UK, Boris Johnson. I went to number 10 Downing Street and took over his Snapchat channel to debunk misinformation about COVID. So all of these wow. random things, really huge things for me. And I was like, wow, this is really... Um, validates and solidifies the work I'm doing because all of these major institutions are approaching me uh, just from making these videos. So for me, that was fantastic. I always love hearing people that are, you know, have more traditional jobs and are able to uh, create content on the side, whether you're, you know, in finance or or in medical and so on, because. I guess this doesn't apply to to your field, but it can also create a lot of clients. You know, if you're at a even at a law firm, which I think can be seen as really distant from from the content creation world, uh, it really gets your name out there. It really builds a personal brand for you, and you're able to to get more clients. Um, how do you think that would be? Do you think that would be welcomed if you would be um, you know kind of like making money on the content as well? Because I guess you get a lot of opportunities for like public speaking and and these brand collabs and so on how do you how do you and they view that yeah I, I would say in the uk anyway the uk is a very different system to how the healthcare system in america set up in many other countries um, america is primarily a privatized healthcare system uh, a doctor after they finish their training is essentially their own boss in the mm. uk uh, you fall under the umbrella of the nhs the national health service so you still work for this government organization. You aren't an independent boss and you can't decide mm. everything on your own. You have to stick to certain guidelines and rules and, you know, you have to, you know, you're boxed in in certain ways. But also having said that, there are lots of gray areas when it comes to doctors and social media in general, but specifically in the UK. There aren't any strict guidelines to adhere to. There's obvious ones that you can't do anything dodgy that might bring the whole profession into disrepute. So if you're promoting fat-burning pills, that would be frowned upon and you could potentially, you know, lose your license or be suspended for, you know, basically peddling rubbish products. But I think, you know, for me anyway, I take the stance of anything that's kind of really dodgy or something that has someone has to consume or edibles or some healthcare product, I think it's a very gray area because you are leveraging your authority and position as a doctor and a lot of people in society will trust your opinion, blindly trust your opinion sometimes. And that's a mm. quite a powerful tool to have. So with that power, you have a certain responsibility to uphold some morals and ethics. So if I went out and said, you need to buy this probiotic and it will improve your gut health. Me as a doctor, as a surgeon who deals with bowel specifically, people would eat that up and buy it. People would be like, yeah. okay, I trust this guy with millions of followers. I'm going to mm. buy this. So that company would profit greatly from it. And I've had approaches mm. by probiotic companies to do that. And I've said no, because I've constantly made videos saying that probiotics don't work for most people. It's just hype, not health. So, you know, the, you have to, you know, have that moral compass sometimes to say no to these very lucrative opportunities sometimes. And that was a very lucrative opportunity. 
I, I think for me, when it comes to brand deals and things like that, I will support charities, go to speaking events, uh, do things which I believe in. If I write a book, I'll be happy to sell my book to people because it's my hard work gone in there. I'm happy to make money from ad revenue from YouTube, for example. That's not costing anyone anything. So I think there are ways to make money. There are good ways and bad ways. As a doctor specifically, I think you are restricted in how well you can do that without compromising your ethics and integrity. I know that TikTok has been like notorious for not paying uh, for views very well. Um, how is that compared to, to YouTube now? I heard it, it's getting better, but maybe not that much. Uh, I'm increasing my activity on YouTube, so I can't fully mm. say how it is. I mean, I'm not fully monetizing my YouTube, but on TikTok, for example, if you get a million views, you get $20 for a million views, mm. So, which is not great because if you've got a million views on Facebook or YouTube, you'd get a very decent pay package, but not on TikTok. It's, you know, $20 for a million views is terrible uh, by any means. So I, I think... You know, they will erode the trust with the creators and lose followers long term if they don't continue to improve their standing. You know, they've done amazing things to stay there this long and compete with the old guards of social media, YouTube, Instagram, Twitter, etc. You know, they're up there. I would say TikTok is just behind YouTube in terms of, you know, how powerful it is and how widely it's used. But they need to quickly allow creators to monetize more efficiently if they want to keep hold of those big creators and not lose them to other platforms. Uh, yeah, I, I heard, um, I think it was like last week or something that YouTube is soon launching, or if they already have, um, monetization in the same way as normal YouTube videos for their shorts, which is pretty cool. So yeah. I think like you're keeping whatever, whatever it is, 45%, but it's kind of like in TikTok form. So I think that can, can actually change things um, for creators that are focused on the short form. So yeah, I wanted to dive into some uh, health and personal development topics as well, because it's a very uh, dear subject of mine and uh, it's something I, I spend a lot of, of energy and time on. Um, so I wanted first to hear you know, your thoughts on, on the the shift work that you are in as a doctor, um, sometimes night shifts and so on. Um, what is the, the science behind that? And what are the issues behind having a very irregular work schedule? Um, as I guess you, you can have sometimes. Yeah, I think shift work is one of the worst things that any human can put their body through. And there are countless research studies and information out there now which shows that sleep deprivation is associated with multiple deleterious effects on the body everything from you know increasing the risk of neurodegeneration and increasing risk of parkinson's alzheimer's etc to worsening your microbiome and gut health causing things like constipation irritable bowel syndrome increase in risk of cardiovascular issues metabolic diseases there's a whole variety of things that poor sleep can cause you know, for everyone and even individual to specific sexes. For men, poor sleep can cause a blunting of testosterone and testicular atrophy, a shrinkage of the testicles. So it's pretty profound what sleep can do. And I think sometimes we take it for granted. When it comes to mm. healthcare work and the irregular sleeping patterns that they have, this is a chronic issue. And I think there have also been studies showing that healthcare workers have a higher than average rate of mortality and morbidity because they're in the profession with all sorts of unsociable working hours, you know, starting a work shift at 1 a.m. and finishing at 8 a.m. So you're essentially breaking your normal biology. You are breaking the circadian rhythm, the natural rhythm that all humans uh, are slaves to, you know, being awake when it's bright outside and being asleep when it's dark outside. You are ignoring the natural cues of light and dark and the temperature cues you have when it dips at night in terms of temperature and it rises in the morning, all of these things are just, you know, in battle constantly with our biology. And for me, I, I've realized for a long time that I'm in a profession that although I'm saving lives and improving people's lives and saving or e extending life years for people, I'm potentially decreasing my life years and decreasing my quality of life because of that. Uh, and the only way around it is to quit the profession. You can 
you know, plug the gaps and paper over the cracks by optimizing your sleep hygiene. But realistically, if you are a healthcare worker and you're doing shift patterns, the only cure for that and reversal for that is quitting the job. How do you deal with it? Like, can you, can you, uh, if you're supposed to start a shift at 4 a.m. Or, or 2 a.m., you have to sleep before and, and then after you're done, obviously. But how do you do that? Do you do like sleeping pills or like certain exercises? Or is there a way to kind of, if not quitting the job, kind of like, you know, soften that in a way? Yeah, I, I mean, I think the best you can do is optimize your um, pre-night shift routine or your pre-shift routine, your intra-shift routine, and your post-shift routine. There are three phases. Pre-shift, so if, for example, if I'm doing a night shift, pre-shift, I will make sure that I keep my meal times the same. So you don't want too many variables um, because, you know, in addition to the circadian clock affecting your brain and your tiredness levels, every cell in your body responds to the circadian rhythm. So you want uh, to minimize the number of variables. The variables include things like hormones and your gut, etc. So I keep my meal times the same. I completely eliminate any source of caffeine that could interfere with the shift routine. Because already when you're doing a shift routine and then you have caffeine at nighttime, that will then still be in your system when you finish your shift. So completely eliminate caffeine. And I will make sure I sleep a little bit or a nap before the night shift. And then during the night shift, the intra shift routine, I will make sure that if I can get some sleep, I will try and get some sleep. Uh, but otherwise I will expose myself if I'm awake to as much light as possible during the shift. I won't be in dark places because, you know, being awake and as alert as possible during the shift means that you will be more sleepy when you finish the shift. If you sometimes try to be in dark areas during the shift, you won't get a uh, adequate rise in or an adequate rise in uh, melatonin when it comes to your sleep during the day. And finally, the post shift routine, when I'm driving from the hospital back to uh, my house to sleep in bed, I'll wear sunglasses to minimize the light entering my eyes. I will have blackout curtains in my room and minimize noise levels so I can again optimize my sleep. Now, all of these things, they are just the, the most optimized thing I can do. And it's, you know, not a gold standard. It's the second rate thing. The optimal thing is not having the shift in the first place, but these are the things that I can do to make sure I have as good a sleep as possible and try to somehow reverse engineer my circadian clock so I can still survive and minimize the effect shift work has on my body. And this also applies to, I mean, there, when you think about it, there, there are so many professions in our society that kind of keeps society working, that, that are working really like crazy hours of the day um you know if you're a policeman or if you're uh, a firefighter um yep. there are so many different ones but even so even if you get the right amount of sleep like in terms of hours and so on even just the the uh the thing that you're awake at night time also has this negative effect on on your health and potentially even life years as you're saying yeah i i think there are so many things that we can easily cut out of the things that we do during the shift routine and just general sleep routines. People reach for these quick fixes. Uh, alcohol, they think it's a sedative and it's going to help them sleep. Alcohol actually disrupts the REM stage of your sleep. And the REM stage of sleep is important for numerous things, including the release of testosterone and general creativity and you know, the dream stages. So alcohol essentially blunts the REM stage, which can affect your entire body system uh, people take sleeping pills again that's similar in terms of its effect to alcohol it's a hypnotic sedative so it blunts all of these the brain firing so it essentially quietens the brain rather than allowing you to have a refreshing sleep it doesn't allow you to get into those deeper sleep stages other things that we have caffeine throughout the day the half-life of caffeine depending on the study you read is anywhere from five to eight hours so if you have a cup of coffee at 2 p.m., when you're at 10 p.m., you'll still have, you know, a significant proportion of caffeine in your system, which is affecting your sleep. All of these things that we do that seem benign are actually deeply and insidiously affecting our sleep. And it's not even, um, it, it's so common. And, 
we're in a sleeplessness pandemic. That's the hidden pandemic where our sleep is being affected. And like I said before, all the body systems in your body, all the organs in your body are affected from your kidneys to your liver, to your heart, to your brain by sleep. And I can't give you a percentage on the amount of chronic diseases which are caused by poor sleep hygiene. I can't, but it's likely to be a great number. Yeah, I, 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 this is one of the things that I think I changed my mind. And, uh, you know, in, in my early years, I was in the military. Um, I tried out investment banking. I was always in these like very macho cultures where sleep was like the last thing you did after everything else was solved. <laughs> Everybody yep. else was happy. Uh, and then you had sleep that always was like the last variable of the equation. Um, but I think like, so I really changed my mind on that. It's easier said than done to, to do it. Um, but one thing that I thought was really interesting was that a lot of these things that people do that they think help them fall asleep easier, kind of like alcohol, as you mentioned, but also, um, smoking weed and certain sleeping pills and so on. They might make you pass out easier, but it's also the quality of the hours that is drastically affected right so even if you think you fell asleep like the quality of that sleep during the night can be just so much worse is that correct yeah 100 percent. so i think when you take all of these you know crutches alcohol sedatives melatonin weed etc they affect the quality in terms of preventing you getting an adequate depth of sleep they can cause parasomnias uh for example, so constant awakenings during the night and you have a fractured sleep. You may not have prolonged uninterrupted sleep. You know, for me, five hours completely uninterrupted is better than seven hours with constant, constant uh, fractionated sleep. Um, you want to promote uninterrupted sleep so you can finish those entire sleep cycles that allow you to plunge to the depths of those deep sleep stages where you get slow wave sleep where your brain is lubricated and washed by cerebrospinal fluid, those toxic proteins are washed away. All of those things are so important. That's why you need the uninterrupted sleep so the full cycle is finished. It's like a, you know, doing all of these things um, is essentially like opening up the washing machine before the cycle is finished. The clothes are still going to be dirty. Even though there's some wash being done, it's still dirty. You need to let the cycle finish and then take your washing out once the cycle's over. When visiting a new country or city, I find that food is at the heart of almost all cultures. But finding the real gems can usually be a challenge, and it can be hard to know where to go for recommendations. A new benefit as an American Express Platinum member is their dining experience, and it's one with a lot of value if you like trying new restaurants like me. I'm a member in Sweden, which gets you a two-course dinner for two people three times per year at selected restaurants. And what I especially like is that it also gives me recommendations to try out new curated restaurants. And also when traveling, you get your money back on the restaurant bill up to a certain level per year. So if you want to read more about how the dining experience works, check out the Platinum card in the description or on the American Express website. The specific dining terms and conditions apply. When working, if coming back to, to the, the doctor job and also, and also some of the other jobs I mentioned before, like firefighter and, and people dealing with a lot of, um, say, trauma and sometimes uh, death, etc., very negative aspects of, of, of life that is happening that you see almost on a constant daily basis. How does that affect you you know, as a person, are you able to turn it off or does that also subconsciously also affect you? Yeah, without doubt. I mean, even if you're, like I said, everything that you experience in life on a daily basis, whether you're involved in some roadside aggression, someone cuts you off and horns at you, even though you might forget about it in an hour, the vestiges of that stress are still with you for the rest of the day. You watch mm. a really deeply disturbing movie you know, you might forget about it mostly for the day. And then the next day you kind of think back to the movie and you're affected. So similarly, it's hard to completely censor these things that I deal with on a daily basis, especially as I'm involved. If there's a surgery and there's a complication I'm involved in, you know, there's a certain amount of guilt and emotional guilt that you're affected by. Uh, a patient makes a complaint or the patient dies or you're breaking in news about a cancer diagnosis someone you have to tell someone's relative that their you know, their family member's dying 
all of these things are really deeply visceral emotions that stay with you. And it's hard to completely filter them off because part of the job of being a healthcare professional is having empathy, empathy for, you know, the patient that you're with. So completely turning down those emotions and dialing it down restricts the empathy. But again, you need some sort of cognitive dissonance where you have some empathy, but also you have to safeguard yourself and give yourself a layer around your brain to not be affected because it's very easy to be overwhelmed by this. And I've seen doctors break down. You know, I felt to the point of breaking down when I saw my first death and when I was doing CPR on a patient and they didn't make it through because I really needed to talk to someone who'd done it before and been through that a lot of times, but I didn't. And those feelings stayed with me and, you know, the feelings of guilt that you didn't uh, allow the patient to survive because you could have done the chest compressions harder or you could have noticed they were getting unwell sooner. So, you know, there's a lot of things which can affect you as a healthcare worker. And I think one of the things your brain does inadvertently is it desensitizes that trauma. So the more of it you're exposed to, it's inevitable that you will increasingly become desensitized to that stimulus. And yeah, because I've always wondered, you know, about doctors and, and, and police officers and so on that come to, um, well, I guess it's mostly police officers that are at the accident scenes um, when, when a really, you know, um, bad car accident, something that is happening because then you're just seeing these things that are not even shown in, in the movies and like how you how you have that in your life and, and in your job, uh, how you handle it. But as you say, I guess you get used to it and you get you can kind of handle it uh, after a while. In addition to sleep, what do you think what do you think are other really everyday things that people um, don't don't really do that well or could change to to improve their lives. I'm not saying it, they should be simple, but that can be pretty in front of your eyes. Um, is it is it like repeating things that you see that people do to themselves that they could change themselves instead of going to a clinic or something? Yeah, I mean, there's <clears throat> there's no real uh, biohacking solutions. You know, no matter how many Joe Rogan podcasts someone listens to or you know, Andrew Huberman podcast someone listens to with all of these 0.1% supplements or things that you can do which will improve your health, you know, like mm. infrared light or saunas. These these are, you know, poor quality studies which have shown various things. So I would ignore the bunch of, you know, the most of what you see on all of these wellness bro podcasts. There are very few foundational things that everyone can do which will most likely improve their quality of life and more importantly, um, give them a longer health span. So longer, healthy life, not just quality, quantity and quality. So these are things like increasing the amount of fiber you take. You know, increasing fiber and the variety of fiber, both insoluble and soluble fibers, and having a range of colorful fruit and veg and things like that will help your gut microbiome flourish. So, you know, in the UK, I usually recommend to patients 30 grams of fiber a day is pretty non-negotiable unless you've got things like irritable bowel syndrome. There's a caveat to that. But for most people, 30 grams of fiber a day is pretty good going and it would ensure regular bowel habit. Another, you know, low hanging fruit is wearing sunscreen. Even in northern hemispheric countries like the UK or Scandinavian countries where you might think, hey, I don't get any sunshine you still need to wear sunscreen even on cloudy days because UV light can still percolate through the clouds. And this reduces your risk of skin cancers, and especially things like melanomas. I've seen countless uh, melanomas in patients uh, who have not worn sunscreen you know, ever, and they've constantly been exposed to the sunlight. And uh, it can be pretty difficult to treat. Um, other things would be stress regulation. So whether that's a digital detox or just cutting down your social media use or meditating, whatever you need to do, just a moment. It can be five, 10 minutes or even 20 minutes at some point in the day where you just kind of have a moment for yourself. We've mentioned obviously sleep, but other things would be just any sort of movement. There's this myth that you have to be intense in your exercise. Everything has to be intense. You need to burn body fat. You need to punish your muscles. You need to feel the burn. You know, we, we've escalated exercise to this point where if it's not intense, it's not good. You know, no pain, no gain. But actually, studies have shown that you just need to move to gain any health benefits. 
I've taken patients who I've, uh, you know, optimized for high risk surgery and we do something called prehabilitation. We just give them a few weeks before surgery. We tell them to cut down smoking and just walk maybe 200 meters a day. And that improves their outcomes after surgery. So just any movement and then you slowly build it up. And other things I mentioned is the obvious things like not smoking, not you know, cutting down alcohol, all of these kind of things. So there's a few just very simple things that everyone can do, whether it's brain health, gut health, skin health, um, or, you know, psychiatric health that people can do. These things that you see uh, about, okay, you need to supplement with magnesium. You need to supplement with this, this, this. All of these things might work in small amounts for an elite level athlete who's already perfected and optimized every other aspect of their health. For the average person, there are all these low hanging fruits that they need to make sure they're doing on a regular basis first. Why do you think that is that we're so much more prone to, I have to admit I'm guilty of the, uh, of the magnesium uh, pills, et cetera, before nighttime. Um, what, what do you think it is that makes us more prone to these, uh, for instance, you know, supplements or, or kind of like, uh, you know, a lot, a lot of the things that you learn on these wellness podcasts and, and, and that kind of thing, instead of these, you know, things that are free and right in front of us just by walking out or, or, or these kind of things that you mentioned. Why do you think that is? Uh, so I think a lot of it is related to authority bias. So all these podcasters, they hack our <laughs> cognitive biases. They might be scientists themselves. They might be just famous. They might have millions of followers. For example, someone like Joe Rogan. And they, they will leverage their authority and people will see them as a celebrity and think they must be right because they're a celebrity. And they will quote all sorts of things to either sell products, sell themselves, or just to sound sexy. It's very sexy if someone says, just 30 minutes of sauna a week can improve your cardiovascular health by X percent. You know, that, mm. that sounds a fantastic thing. Oh, wow, I'll do that. But realistically, if you go to the source of that information, that will be one study in Sweden that had 15 participants. You can't base science on one study of 15 participants and say, yes, that is true. Mm. And this is what happens. You know, the statistics that you read in scientific paper can be massaged. We have this thing in research where we say shit in, shit out. If you put shit information into an analysis, you will still get shit quality outcomes because it's poor quality data that goes in. You know, if you put poor quality ingredients to make a cake, the cake will still taste bad because you've not used good ingredients. So a lot of these things that these people, um, you know, make grand claims about, you have to take with a pinch of salt. And I think, again, coming back to that cognitive bias, we want to believe that there are shortcuts that we can do to improve our health because really we don't want to do the hard things. We don't want to do the difficult things. We don't want to make sure we get, you know, we want to stop Netflix an hour before bed. We don't want to wind down. We don't want to meditate. We don't want to go to bed at 10 p.m. and then have a regular sleep-wake cycle. We want to binge watch Emily in Paris for, you know, overnight for three hours because a pill is so much easier. A pill allows us to do all the bad things and then wipe away the stuff with just a pill. Um, so that's what we want things easy. But unfortunately, these things aren't easy. Sleeping well isn't easy. It's going to take you several weeks to fine-tune your sleep pattern. That's just the harsh reality. And I guess, I, I don't know if, if this is the, uh, like the reality, but I, I think I've experienced that this has just increased so much the last, let's say five years. Like the good thing with social media, uh, or there are a lot of good things is that it kind of takes out this middleman, but there's also has its backside where, you know, anyone can talk to a lot of people. Um, and there are no like checks and balances when it comes to health recommendations and so on. So uh, I wanted to hear like. You also mentioned social media before and, and the kind of the stress that that um, increases on people and your take on especially these newer platforms um, with short form content and TikTok uh, and many of the newer social medias, um, reducing our attention span, um, increasing clickbait isms and so on. On the other hand, it's also helping people like you and me. Um, how do you balance that and, you know, how should people handle it? Because I think it's a tool. It's hard to say that it's good or bad. It's like a tool as, as a lot of other things. But how do you think 
one balances it. Yeah, I think social media can be used for a, be a tool for good and for evil and for misinformation. We know that, but hopefully, the positive information and the education and the entertainment someone can have outweighs all the negative stuff, like the cyberbullying to the misinformation to the trolling, all that kind of stuff. It's usually, I think, it balances itself out because people, you know, want to have fun online, and it's always the minority. Uh, which is the kind of poor quality, you know, rubbish stuff. I, I think at the end of the day, more ownership probably need to be taken by these organizations, like the platforms themselves. I know Facebook and YouTube, they cut down massively on COVID misinformation over the last uh, two or three years. And, you know, you can say that that impinges on free speech. But at the end of the day, you know, we want to allow free speech, but we can't allow misinformation and stuff that is clearly either misogynistic or sexist or, you know, hurts people to flourish. We can't allow that. So I mm. think there needs to be some sort of middle ground reached um, between the platforms, between creators, maybe a whitelisting of certain creators who promote certain things, who are experts, you know, some scientific expert may need to be whitelisted by YouTube to say, okay, we need to promote this guy's content because he's actually making good quality stuff. Or, you know, this doctor, she's making incredible content. Let's, you know, encourage her and collaborate with her. So I think it's a fine balance. But realistically, you'll never be able to control the amount of rubbish and evil social media does unless you just ban social media, which will never happen. Yeah, so as of now, it's very unregulated um, and people can... can almost post whatever they want um but but do you think that there should be more kind of like i don't know what the right word for it is but kind of like content regulation when it comes to when it comes to health for instance do you think that would be a good thing for these social platforms to do yeah i think definitely online it's very difficult to tell who's an expert and who's not especially in the health space um you know seemingly now you can just wear some scrubs and put on a stethoscope and people will think you're a doctor so when i yeah. first started making tiktok content I would do it with a stethoscope and my scrubs. And I very quickly realized, number one, that's a cringe thing to do. If I'm not at work and I'm wearing scrubs and a stethoscope, it's cringe. So I stopped doing that. And number two, I don't want people to, you know, think that they need to listen to my content just because I'm wearing a certain uniform or, you know, mm. trying to uh, replicate a certain image. So if you look at all my videos now, pretty much I'm just in my own clothes yeah. at home in my library with this sort of background. And because I want people to listen to the content and follow me for the content, not because they think I'm a figure of authority. Um, and if you watch my videos, you, you might not even know I'm a doctor, but I mean, my, my handle says Dr. Curran, but if you just saw the video on its own, it's just a dude talking about science and health content. And hopefully someone enjoys that and they'll follow based on that, not on the image of a stethoscope. And coming back to kind of like, uh, you know, your life um do you see we talked about a lot of the opportunities that come out from from creating content and, and becoming a content creator um do you also see like any any of the downsides with it do you feel that there's a content treadmill that you have to be on to kind of like live up to an expectation in terms of volume or i guess people also come up to you uh on the streets because you're getting more and more um uh, familiar uh is, is that something that you see as a as a bad thing or a good thing or how do you how do you handle it um i mean i'll be honest i i don't go out too much out and about um you know when i have my time off i'm just at home with my dog or something but when i you know on the odd occasion when i'm entering out in london or on public transport you know i might get recognized by people and I, it's it's a nice thing for me i mean i'm not intending to be a celebrity or be someone famous you know this is just the natural consequences of increasing familiarity when people see you on social media so i enjoy it because it's just a validation that someone enjoys my content and they come say hi to me so that that's fun um i don't think it's a bad thing unless there's a massive you know people found out where i work and there's a massive queue outside the hospital of people wanting to either see me uh, because then that would obviously uh, get slightly ridiculous and that would then start affecting the work but as long as something like that doesn't happen which i don't think it will any time I think it's uh, yeah, it's a, it's quite a nice thing. Do do patients recognize you? Uh, I've been recognized a couple of times by patients, um, and uh, yeah, it's been it's been an interesting experience actually. It's been sometimes been unexpected. 
Um, but you know, it's usually done, you know, in a, in a kind of like good way that, okay, I reckon I love your content, this and that, but I quickly, you know, make my escape because, uh, you know, I don't want any conflict of interest arising in any way. And now it's on TikTok, it's over 5 million. Do you, do you, do you know, like on TikTok, it's, it's usually younger people, but like, what do you see in terms of age? Do you see all ages of people that are, you know, recognizing and reaching out to you or, or is it mainly younger people or how, how is the follower base? Uh, yeah, I mean, you can roughly see the analytics across all platforms. Uh, <laughs> I would say the kind of peak is generally on most of my platforms is between 24 and 35. That's the kind of rough highest peak. Um, but on other platforms, there are, you know, a, a bigger percentage of other demographics in terms of ages as well for Example on Facebook, I have a larger than average percentage compared to the average creator um, of people following me in their 40s, 50s, 60s, and 70s even. Um, the content I create, I combine it with entertainment and education. So I feel that it can reach all ages, uh, whether you're seven years old or 70, because health is you know, not uh, restricted to one specific age. Everyone is affected by health in some way and everyone wants to optimize their health. So I feel it could be applicable to all ages. And when you, like in the second wave of, of you starting uh, to create the content in 2019, 2020, um, and when it started taking off, uh, like, did you receive pushback or, you know, anything like that from, from friends or from, from work? Or um, if you did, how did you handle it? Uh, yeah, I mean, I generally found that the, the support was there and it was a positive feedback I got. People, you know, liked my videos. My colleagues and other people in the hospital, whether it's a pharmacist or a physio or a nurse, they would come up and say, we enjoy your content. So that was great. I think there will always be inevitably some people who don't want to, you know, share in your success and have want you to have the success. And that will be in any facet of life, whether you're a sports person who's doing well, whether you're a... Um, you know, someone who's doing well in business in your life, there will always be, whether it's online trolls or real life trolls who just don't um, want you to succeed. But, you know, I think they're always in the minority and I think that the focus always has to be on forward and surrounding yourself with people who enjoy your content and want you to succeed. And that's what I've continually done. And the only way to almost counter these people is to just increase your success. Yeah. And if somebody is in a, you know, especially I think in a conservative field, you know, medical finance, um, lawyer or, or something like that, what is your advice if somebody wants to start doing something on the side, which is, uh, you know, creating content or just something else, which is very different to what they're doing, for instance, like DJing or so on. What's, what's your advice to somebody that doesn't really feel they, uh, dare doing it either. It's because because of you know their friends or what people are going to say about them in school or at work or so on. What what advice would you give these people? Well, I, I think again we're often struck by this spotlight effect where we think the whole world is watching us and cares what we do and is waiting for our downfall and waiting for us to slip up so they can laugh. And that is we we tend to overestimate the amount of importance other people pay towards us. Realistically, no one's watching and no one cares what you do. So just do it, pretty much. You know, it, you, can you think back to the last party you were in and can you remember if someone did something embarrassing? Probably not. But the person who did something embarrassing is probably stressing about it for days afterward thinking, oh my God, I embarrassed myself. No one actually no. cares. We have short attention spans. Uh, I think the important thing is just to get started, whether it's content creation. I started with on TikTok with just my mobile phone and me talking into the camera. Minimal equipment, just my phone, no lighting, no sound, no editing. So you don't need much, you know, there's people uh, in India, Afghanistan, or, you know, Somalia, just on their phones, they don't have fancy equipment, just being on TikTok on their phones. So it shows you don't need to have a high production quality to get started on anything. And I think if you surround yourselves with these things, like saying, okay, I need to buy this editing software, I need to buy lighting, then I'll start. You're just giving yourself excuses and barriers to starting. You just need to start and go from there. And one thing I always say is that it's better to regret something that you've done wrong than, you know, regret not doing that thing at all. Go start yeah. on social media, start a hobby or whatever, 
fail at whatever you're doing, but at least you can say you've done it and you failed and it's not for you if that's what you feel, then constantly having that nagging feeling of, I wonder what would happen if I did that. You know, that, that's my opinion anyway. I actually had a, I, I had something like that. I was, um, I was in acting when I was, uh, when I was younger, I was very interested in it and I was in a musical and then the years passed and I was in, you know, kind of like business school, um, during the bachelor. But then after I was done, I was actually going for six months in acting school and just trying it out. And I realized after like four months, I, this is not for me, <laughs> but uh, you know, it was like, I loved it because it gave me a lot of, you know, um, a lot of learnings. And I think a lot of people would actually enjoy acting, even if they don't want to become actors. But then I anyways learned that I don't want to be an actor and it felt really good to just have tried it and kind of like know that. Um, and I guess that could apply as well. I, I guess a lot of people don't really know what it's like to be a content creator, but they're really interested in it and might want to try it out. And they might find out that they don't, they don't want to be a uh, content creator. So I, I guess that applies in, in there as well. Yeah. Just getting closure. Um, yeah. So, um, what, what's next for you now? Do you, do you have said any, any plans, uh, for, for this year when it comes to the, the creator side of, of Dr. Karen, or do you want to go into new fields or how, how do you see that? Uh, yeah, I mean, this year I wanted to focus on just making more YouTube content, longer form content. And, you know, I've sort of guested, um, on many podcasts with, you know, friends and various other people. And I like having conversations with people. One of the most engaging things that I think you can do, and for me anyway, it's equivalent to learning from books, is actually talking to people and learning from them like we're doing right now. So that's one thing that I'm considering maybe a podcast of my own in 2023. Uh, but again, have to balance it with all the other things I'm doing. All right, man. Thank you so much uh, for today. It's been uh, it's been a pleasure um, to have you here. And uh, how do people how do people find your your different channels? And where would you people who haven't seen you before? Where would you direct them if they want to see more? Um, probably my most active right now is on my Instagram, Dr. Karen Rajan. Um, and I'm but I'm Dr. Karen pretty much across every platform. All right. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.